Seven. If we sum up the three fairy tales we have looked at so far, it is typical for all these heroines to live isolated in nature. In The Girl Without Hands, for many years the woman drifted more and more out of life and was cured only by accepting the fact that she had to stay quiet in the woods and temporarily not go back into life. This is a very frequent motif, and being excluded from life for many years, it seems to me typically to illustrate a problem of feminine psychology. From the outside, it looks like a complete stagnation, but in reality, it is a time of initiation and incubation when a deep inner split is cured and inner problems solved. This motif forms a contrast to the more active quest of the male hero who has to go into the beyond and try to slay the monster or find the treasure or the bride. Usually he has to make more of a journey and accomplish some deed instead of just staying out of life. There seems to be a typical difference between the masculine and feminine principles. The unconscious is experienced as isolation by the heroine and afterward it comes the return into life. What is also relevant is that the handless maiden in our fairy tale is also confronted with a deep religious problem, for she comes under the influence of both angel and devil. As you know, in the beginning of the story, the devil tried to get her into his power, but she escaped, and later was protected by an angel. She comes under two divine influencers, that of the dark side, the devil, and that of the angel, as the messenger of God. In the Russian version, even God himself helps her. This is not typical for our civilization only. In primitive material, you find exactly the same problem of the heroine being confronted with the powers of good and evil as soon as she goes into the unconscious. In a woman, this has to do with the problem of the animus. In masculine psychology, you can say that the anima in man entangles him in life and its problems, in dealing with his instincts and drives, and so faces him also with an ethical problem. But the anima never directly puts the problem of his Weltanschauung to a man. Rather, she puts him indirectly into a situation in which he has to revise his whole religious attitude toward life. The woman, on the other hand, is directly confronted with the problem of good and evil as soon as she goes into the unconscious because the animus has to do with ideas and concepts. When she goes on the journey within, she is at once confronted with God and the devil. Drifting out of life can also be dangerous for a heroine. It can happen that a woman does not find her way back into the human world. This is illustrated by an Eskimo fairy tale reported by Nude Rasmussen about a woman who became a spider. The Woman Who Became a Spider Synopsis of the Tale There was once a man and a woman who had a daughter, and they would have lived quite happily together if the daughter had not despised men. Her father wanted her to marry, but she always refused. Many young men came of their own volition, for she was a beautiful girl. It also happened that the father would bring home young men in the evening so that they may meet his daughter, but nothing helped. The mere mention of men made the girl bad-tempered, and if any came to the house, she went off on her own. One day, her father told her that he did not bring men to the house in order to make her sad or to hurt her, but that she should remember that they had no son, and that she was their only daughter and their only child. Her mother and he would soon be old, and for many years he would not be capable of providing them with food and clothing, and who would help them in their old age if they had no son-in-law. These words made the girl very sad, and she wandered out into the great uneven, undulating plains, on which were many small hills. Suddenly, a head jumped out of the earth among the hills, a head without a body, but the face was that of a very handsome man. And the young man smiled at the girl and said, You don't want to have a husband, but I come here to fetch you, and you must know that I come of a big and powerful race. For the first time in her life, the young girl was happy with the young man, and she lifted up the head and put it carefully in her fur coat 
and carried it home when it was dark. She slipped noiselessly into the house and put the head of the handsome young man beside her couch and lay there and talked gaily and happily with the stranger, whom she loved because he was not like other men. Her father awoke and heard the whispering and giggling from his daughter's couch and could not understand what was happening there. It was repeated during the coming nights, and the father was happy, for now he knew that at last he had a son-in-law and a hunter in the house. From now on, the girl was always happy. Formerly, she had stayed away from the village during the daytime so as to avoid the men, but now she often stayed at home and hardly ever moved from her couch. But the father and mother were very much surprised never to see their son-in-law. One day, when the girl was out, it happened that the father pushed aside the fur rug on her couch to find out who kept his daughter company during the night. When he found the living head of a handsome young man, a head without a body, he was very angry. He took a meat skewer and thrust it through the young man's eye and threw the head out into the rubbish heap, crying, I have no use for a son without a body who could not hunt for us when we are old. The head rolled away and went farther and farther over the plains in front of the house and at last disappeared into the sea, leaving a bloody track behind it. The following night, the father and mother heard the girl crying and sobbing all through the night, and the next morning she asked where her husband was. The father answered that it had no use for such a son-in-law. You are talking stupidly and you have behaved foolishly, answered the girl. For he was a capable man, and not an ordinary human being, and now I will no longer remain at home with you. The girl dressed and went out and followed the bloody track, which led directly to the sea. She wanted to dive into the waves, but they were as hard as wood and she could not. Then she went inland looking for a white lemming which was supposed to have fallen down from heaven, for she knew the lemmings had special magic powers hidden in them. At last, she caught one and threw it into the sea, and at once the waves parted and a road appeared, which she followed to the bottom of the sea. In the distance, she noticed a little house. She ran to it and looked through the window and saw an old couple with their son. The son lay on a sleeping bench and had recently lost an eye. The girl called, Here I am, come out. The young man answered that he would not come out to her and that he would no longer come after her, for her parents despised him, even though the girl said she was never going back to her parents. The young man said he would never have anything more to do with her. The girl was very much depressed, without knowing what she was doing. She ran three times around the house in the same direction as the sun circles around in the heavens. Then she saw two ways. One led straight ahead to the earth, and the second went up to heaven. She chose the way which led to heaven, and when the man saw that, he cried out to her that she was going the wrong way and should turn around, that she was going up to heaven and would never come back again. It's all the same where I go, said the girl, if you won't live with me anymore. Now the young man regretted his words, but too late begged her to come back, for she only went higher and higher up to heaven until she disappeared out of sight. The girl went on without knowing herself how she did it and came at last to something that looked like a lid with a hole in it, but it was difficult to get to the hole and she did not know how to get on. At last, she took courage and jumped and got hold of the edge and swung herself through the opening and once more found air and heaven and land. A little to one side was a lake to which she went and sat down so that she might die here and her body disintegrate. She didn't want to think anymore. Life no longer meant anything to her. Suddenly she heard the splashing of oars on the lake and looked up and saw a man in a kayak. Everything he had, his kayak, his oar, and his harpoon, everything was of shining copper. The girl sat quite still and scarcely dared breathe. She did not think that anybody could see her in the deep grass in which she had hidden herself. 
the man sank. A woman's breath tempts a kayak who crosses the shining lake to caress the soft cheeks. As the man finished his song, he raised one arm high up and toward heaven and dropped the other down toward the lake. The girl saw that the upper part of her body was naked and that her fur coat lay across the strange man's arm. Again, the man sang the song, and as he finished it and raised one arm and dropped the other, the rest of the woman's clothing flew over onto his raised arm. The girl sat there naked and ashamed and couldn't understand what was happening to her. For the third time, the man sang his song, but this time, the girl lost consciousness. And when she came to herself, she was sitting beside the man in his kayak. The man rode her far away with her, far over the lake with his bright copper oars, which glistened wetly in the air. They did not speak to each other until they came to a place where they saw two houses. At the entrance to the village was a big house, and in the background a small one. Then the man said in a stern voice, You must go into the big house, not into the little one. The girl did what the man told her and went into the big house and the man rode away. It was dreary in the big house, not a soul was in it, but she had hardly entered before a small woman ran in. She wore extraordinary clothing made out of the gut of a bearded seal. She cried out to the girl to come into the other house, for the man with whom she had come was dangerous and would kill her. The girl came out at once and went into the other house. Here, a little girl with whom the extraordinary woman dressed in gut skins lived, sat on the sleeping bench. The young girl, who had run away from the man she loved, no longer thought about anything much. Sometimes, she thought that she was already dead, but she heard what the others said and saw them go around the house. And the woman came and whispered to her that this time she was saved, but that the man with whom she had come it was not an ordinary man, that nobody could resist him, and that soon he would come and would be very angry that she had left his house. But the woman would help her, and she gave her a small cask filled with water, in which were four small pieces of whale skin. She told her that when the strange man came, she should hide at the entrance of the house and throw the pieces of whale skin at his face, for the woman had sung a magic song over her present so as to make it strong. Soon, he came back in his kayak. He sat down beside the sea and called out that she should stay quiet in his house, that he would not do harm to her, and that she could never be hidden from him. Then he came flying through the air like a bird and circled his house four times and then came to the small house. There he picked up his bird arrow but cried out that he would not kill her. The girl stood hidden in the bend of the entry to the house and threw the pieces of whale skin at his face. In the same moment, he fell down out of the air and lost his strength. Then the three women went into his house, which was the house of the moon spirit, and it was the man in the moon himself, which the little woman in the skins had made harmless for a time through her magic. The moon spirit is incalculable and can become dangerous. He takes but he also gives, and man must sacrifice to him in order to share in the things for which he rules. The three women went into his house and up in the rafters. The three women went into his house and up in the rafters, crowds of reindeer ran about. In the corner was a big water barrel, big as an inland lake. The women went to it and looked in and saw whales and walruses and seals swimming about. In the middle of the floor lay the shoulder blade of a whale. The women pushed it to one side and saw an opening leading down to the earth from which one could see into the dwelling places of humans. One could see the people quite clearly and hear them calling out for all the things they wanted. There were so many who cried out to be given whale meat. Others said they wanted a long life. The moon spirit is so powerful that he can give humans all these things. The young girl looked at the countries of the earth and discovered far, far below, 
Tikarak, the largest place in Xinyu. Here there were many women's boats and many busy people. They were collecting water in small casks and throwing it up to the new moon so that they might have a good catch. It was all like a dream. She could not understand how she herself had gotten to all that, which she knew well from the stories that old people told. It was perhaps just a new moon, for the little woman in the skins had made the moon spirit unconscious. For as long as the moon spirit is weak, men sacrifice to him. They bring all their wishes before he becomes the big full moon, which can shine like copper. Now the girl saw how the people prayed to the moon for a good catch. Some of the men had such strong magic formulas that their water ladles came quite near to the moon spirit's house. On the earth, these water ladles were quite small, but here, through the magic words, they became enormous and were filled with cool, fresh water. These sacrifices were brought to sea animals, who often suffered from thirst. Sometimes a whale and sometimes a walrus and sometimes a seal was put into the ladles, which reached the house of the moon spirit. That meant the man's prayer was heard and his sacrifice accepted, and that he would have a good catch. But those ladies which remained near the earth, down by the people's dwellings, belonged to the bad hunters who had no luck. The young girl saw all that and remembered the pleasure that followed the catch and she became homesick. She, who a little while ago had only thought of dying. The old woman in the skins and her little companion were sorry for her and wanted to help her get back to the earth. The three women played a rope out of the sinews of many animals, a very long rope, which they rolled up into a ball as they played it. Soon it was finished, and the old woman said, you must shut your eyes let yourself down but in that minute when you touch the earth you must open your eyes quickly if you don't you will never become a human again the young girl fastened the end of the rope right to the heavens and took the great ball of plaid sinews and began to let herself down she thought it would be a very long way but she felt the ground beneath her feet sooner than she had expected it happened so quickly that she didn't open her eyes quickly enough and she was changed into a spider. From her come all the spiders of the world, all come from the girl who let herself down from heaven to the earth by a rope of plaited sinews. The girl in this story is out of the ordinary society since she rejects the usual human fate of getting married at a certain age and continuing the instinctual life of the tribe. The story ends badly which is typical for many primitive stories, but not much more so than for those of our civilization. The breaking of the taboo or the wish for something special is evaluated negatively and leads to a fatal end. There is, for instance, an African story to which the girl was to marry a man belonging to another tribe, which would be against the marriage laws of her own tribe. She marries a man from another country and suffers a terrible fate. The man who owns a magic bull is killed, and in the end, she is killed also. This is typical for many stories where there is the wish for something special against the ordinary rules of life, and the end is hopeless tragedy. There is, however, the opposite idea in some other fairy tales. For instance, in the Moor and Psyche and the singing, soaring lion lark, in which the girl wants a special husband, the father tells his three daughters that he is going on a journey and he asks them what he should bring them. Two say jewelry, but the third wants a lion lark, which turns out to be an animal bridegroom, a kind of ghost bridegroom with whom she finds great happiness after various tribulations and difficulties. Here we have the opposite pattern in which the girl's special wish, after a long journey and various complications, leads to a beautiful union with a marvelous kind of ghost bridegroom, and the whole story is told as a positive development. But in the Eskimo story, the special wish leads to destruction. The story did not necessarily have to go that way. When the girl came back to Earth, she did not open her eyes quickly enough, and that simple mistake makes the whole difference. The natural conclusion would be 
that had she opened her eyes at the right time, she would have become a kind of shaman priestess who would have known about the mysteries of the beyond through her own experiences and could have told her tribe all about the things on the other side and would have acquired the reputation of a great shamaness. The woman who knows and who has had a personal experience of the collective unconscious. The initiated person who, through her special experiences, would know what was happening in the unconscious. It is only this minor mistake of not opening her eyes quickly enough when she returns to Earth which gives the story the negative outcome. Interpreted psychologically, it seems that if there is a situation in which consciousness is too weak, the experience of the unconscious turns it negative instead of positive. The great problem, and something we always have to keep in mind in psychological work, is whether the analyzant's consciousness or the substance of his personality, something we can feel but cannot describe, is strong enough to carry the experience of the collective unconscious. Some people are confronted with amazing experiences of the unconscious, even of the collective unconscious, but on account of a certain feebleness of reaction, they have no positive results from the experience. In the case of schizophrenics, nothing results from even the deepest experience. At the crucial moment where the material should be integrated, nothing happens. I remember once, for example, talking to a Polish-Mexican peasant woman in the Napa Valley State Hospital in California. She was good-looking, middle-aged. Uh, she sometimes produced the most astounding archetypal material from the collective unconscious and, unlike most schizophrenics, was pleased if she had a chance to talk about it. She had a kind of uh, manic streak in her. When I met her, she immediately began to tell me what God and Jesus Christ had looked like when she had been on the moon and seen the heavens. It was quite interesting, but she had no connection with it. She told these things with great feeling, but was quite absent herself. She was just spinning like a spider who let out a thread and runs up and down on it. She went along with her own thread and was not human. One felt that there was nobody there to whom one could talk. In such a case, one feels as though one were confronted with a vacuum. There is astonishing and interesting material, but nothing human to it. The spider woman told the girl in the story to keep her eyes shut until she reached the earth. The journey to the earth was no great distance, and it does not seem that she had kept her eyes shut through fear. It is more likely that she did not want to face the return to reality. It might be a great come down to be once more in reality having been married to the moon god. I knew of a very poor, miserable man whose mother was a whore and father a drunkard and who went off his head and was put into the hospital with the most serious cases. A good doctor treated the case and got him into a relatively normal condition so that he could work in the fields, seemed completely adapted and was put into the ward with the least mad patients. Then the doctor started talking to him very discreetly about leaving the hospital. And the man said, Oh no, doctor, you are not going to catch me. And off he went back into the worst ward and was as mad as before. He did not want to open his eyes and return to earth, where he had had such a miserable life. After his great experiences, he did not wish to become normal again. There is very often such a tendency in people who do not want to come back, and there is a certain amount of conscious decision about it. For return to the misery of this world is a poor substitute for marriage to a ghost and the moon god. Also, in the case of the Polish woman, I had the feeling that she was happy in her madness. She liked to clean the floors of the hospital, where she was quite free and worked very well. Neither do I think she was not humble enough to return to human life. She was just asleep. She was like a rabbit, which sleeps with its eyes open. And the intuitive feeling one had about her was just like that, a human being who was asleep, in spite of the fervor with which she related her experiences. Everybody in the hospital liked her, and you could ask her to tell you a story any time. She would spin an archetypal yarn and then walk off again. She was a spinster, that's where the word comes from, or a spider who did not open her eyes 
unto this world. The head people, according to the circumpolar tribes, are the people who lived under the sea, ghosts consisting only of the head. Certain African tribes who believe that there are head people, ghosts who roll about as bodiless heads, they are considered rather dangerous and are used for magic purposes. They constitute a powerful population under the earth or the sea and are supposed to be the spirits of the dead, the pure essence of the dead contained in the head. Sometimes they are the skull and sometimes the head people. The girl is attracted to the ghost instead of a human bridegroom and is very happy with him. It is a marvelous illustration of what we so dryly and technically express as onimus possession, which is an abstract formula meaning that the woman is married to a head bridegroom and unattainable and unapproachable on the human side. She is in constant conversation with this autonomous spiritual factor with whom she has long inner conversations. If one could watch oneself when in an animus possessed state, which one cannot, one would see, as one does in another woman, that one is constantly engaged in an inner conversation, thinking about and discussing things that one cannot tell other people. One cannot interrupt it, for it is completely involuntary. There is no Archimedean point outside from which the thing can be viewed. Only the onlooker notice that the anima-possessed woman is linked up in conversation with an inner spiritual process. She is so in it that she cannot see it. That is why such women appear not to be quite there, and as though they had something up their sleeve, for they keep something to themselves. The head is a wonderful image of the animus with its opinions and musings going on all the time. In this case, the father hears the head husband talking, which is what often happens. Animus possession is especially irritating for a real man, a human bridegroom who would have killed or hurt the head. It has an automatically irritating effect on the living man who cannot stand this process going on in a woman. You can see this in life when a girl begins to have her own ideas. The father hears his daughters arguing and feels the animus growing and having disliked and loathed that in his wife and in other women when she too begins. He comes down on it. It is an age old tragedy that the beginnings of mental activities in the daughters are smashed or doomed by the father's reactions. Many women are seriously lamed on the spiritual and mental side in their work because the father, in a bad moment, had told him they could not do something. A woman of 50 once told me that she had wanted to learn Greek when 10 years old, and her father had told her that she was not capable of that. Fathers should not discourage their daughters in that way, for that affects their development, and it is not the way to get the girl out of onimus possession. Such paternal reactions have a devastating effect, for they affect the inner mentality of the girl. Onimus and Anima in Statu Nascendi are not elegant. They are below the mark. For instance, boys at 16, when the Eros problem first comes up, suddenly do not work at school. They just stand around and have acne on their faces and backs. One of our German teachers used to say, are you sitting in the boys' swamp again? They have languishing fantasies, are swamped by feelings, physical reactions, and sexual and other fantasies of the most vague and stupid form. That is what the beginning of heterosexuality and the first awakening of the anima look like. If you get to know them better, you will find that they write terribly sentimental poems to girls, at which time the mother or sisters by their mocking remarks can hit or destroy something, just as the father does to the girls. It requires a superior attitude of consciousness to see and ignore such things discreetly. One should disregard these formative processes which have to go through certain stages, and this applies to the girls' animus as well. When it first appears, it is unyielding and fantastic, and fathers should not attack it but apparently even Eskimo fathers become irritated. So the girl runs away into the sea, into the waters of the collective unconscious, 
but there too she is rejected. That comes from her own hurt, for, like the woman whose father had told her she could not learn Greek, the it in her did not want to learn anymore. The creative animus is so sensitive at that stage that one cannot regain one's enthusiasm, cannot get it back again, and then the same mistake takes place. Then the girl has two paths to choose from. She misses the path to earth, but goes up to the sky, in spite of the warning the head gives her. This time, because she has been warned, she is really responsible for her mistake, but she says to the head, if you won't live with me anymore, it is all the same to me where I go. That resembles the German saying, it serves my father right if my feet are frozen and I get ill. That is the reaction she falls into. We know from other stories and from archetypal material that a tendency to marry a head is generally due to a father complex in the daughter, but the story does not say so. It is true that the very fact that she preferred the head bridegroom to a human one was probably to do with the father, but as it is not mentioned, I have not taken it up. In a story which we shall take up later, that the father is responsible is well illustrated. The mother's animus could also be responsible, but that would take a slightly different form. The mother's animus is seen in Snow White. There it is the negative mother and her animus. And there, the girl too has to go into the forest into a state of incubation. One might say that either the father's anima or the mother's animus could account for the daughter being driven out of life. But quite honestly, why should it always be blamed on the parents? For since mankind first existed, man has brought with him a certain amount of negative unconsciousness. That legacy is handed on from one generation to the other. And perhaps it was always so. Perhaps it is the general human condition. One is influenced not only by one's visible parents, but by their unconscious, quite normally so and everywhere. I think it is a very rational, causal way of thinking always to say it is the father's anima or the mother's animus. Everybody is born of parents who have a conscious and an unconscious attitude. We know in fact that if parents are in connection with their unconscious, the pressure on the children might be less, but even so, I would say that no human being escapes the condition of being influenced by the parents unconscious. Why one girl is more influenced by the father's anima and another by the mother's animus depends, I think, on the original disposition of the child. One child will develop a strong father complex and the other, of the same family, does not. It is the effect of the inborn disposition that this daughter is more concentrated on the father and more affected by his unconscious. It is not quite so simple as that, but we know that a daughter who is more fascinated by the figure of the father than by the mother in her youth tends more to the fate of being separated from life. The one way out is to take the responsibility for what one is and to make an enormous effort to interrupt the curse on the chain which goes on from one generation to another. You see it even expressed in dreams. A patient was told by a dream to do a special thing which would redeem his father. If he did what his father did not do, he would interrupt the curse. I knew a man who had never stood up against his mother's moods and was under the domination of his wife whom he let do everything in order to have peace and a pleasant atmosphere. His son had great difficulty in asserting his masculinity but had to learn to do so. He married a girl with a rather powerful animus and the situation repeated itself. For even in the first months of marriage she wanted her own way and he had to stand up for things and the battle started again. He dreamed several times that he should redeem his dead father, that is, what his father had not done, he should now do. He had the responsibility of not continuing the same curse, otherwise his child would have the same problem. He had to stop the process of the ancestral curse, which in dreams was expressed by saying that he had to redeem his ancestors. 
The one who had to become conscious is the one who had to stop the curse that went on through the generations. As mentioned before, one has also to consider the inborn disposition of the child, which either accepts or rejects the parental influence. One child, if told by her father that she would never be able to learn Greek, would say, I'll show you. It need not necessarily be as it was in the case of the woman mentioned. Already within herself was a thing which lamed her, so that long after the father had died, she could not learn Greek. Whatever she tried to do, a voice said, you are not capable of that. She had the kind of animus that prevents every kind of development by discouraging thoughts. One could say that the father stepped into the trap of her expectations. It can happen that people have such a powerful complex that lays traps for you, and if you are not very conscious, you fall into them. For instance, I do not tend to cheat or send Anna Lizanne's bills for the wrong accounts, but I once had a woman whose mother had always cheated her over money, and believe it or not, I sent the woman a bill for more than she owed me. Naturally, that constellated the whole drama, and I sat there flabbergasted. If you are not on guard in such a case, you can get pushed into the role of father or mother. One has to watch out day and night not to be caught. Because if one is not sufficiently aware of one's own shadow, the analyzant's complexes will force one to act in their pattern. It has such a collective effect that one is not quite conscious. All analyzants try to push the analyst into their ancestral pattern. So it might be that the child's disposition invites the parent's reactions. The modern medical outlook of a causal relation of facts only is not a true evaluation, but a typical superstition in our civilization, which does not correspond to the facts if one looks at them more closely. The girl in our story goes up to heaven through a hole. Such a description is typical for the Eskimos, who think of heaven as being just as the same as the earth a mirror image of this earth, and where the moon god lives. The moon god is another beautiful animus figure, but different from the head in the sea because he is not a single ghost of a dead person, but the generally recognized god of the tribe, a god to whom the Eskimos do not show much love, but to whom they pray for luck in hunting. When it is a question of survival, everything depends on a good catch. And he is therefore a god of fertility and the bestower of life. This is interesting because people who have not gone into the details of mythological study tend to think that the male god principle has always to do with the spiritual and that the mother goddess has always to do with the fertility of crops and animals and so forth. In many Eskimo tribes the bestower of food is a feminine goddess. For instance Sedna who lives at the bottom of the sea and whom the shamans have to visit to rid her hair of lice or heal some wound, after which they will be lucky again, is such a goddess. Sometimes a woman goddess bestows the fertility of nature, but here it is a male god who has that function. One must not fall into a schematical way of thinking and say that the moon is feminine and that the goddess of fertility is a mother goddess. Even in Roman times, the moon god was hermaphroditic. There existed a North African Ithlophilic moon god. Also in the old Egyptian civilization, the moon god Min had an enormous erect phallus and was a god of fertility in all realms. His animal was the bull. So the moon is not always feminine, but it is a nature god and a spirit of fertility. You could therefore say that the essence of the idea of earthly fertility could be attributed to a feminine or to a masculine principle. One has to look at the whole context of the culture to find out why it is so. In China, in Polynesia, and in most of the Indian mythologies, they speak of our mother the earth and our father the sky. But in Egypt, it is the opposite. Geb, the earth principle, is a male god, and Nut, the sky goddess, is female. Now. How is the Egyptian civilization different from most others? In the Egyptian civilization, the concreteness of ideas is very striking. Like all peoples, for instance, 
the Egyptians hope for immortality, but only in Egypt has the idea been expressed by such a material preservation of the body. They tried to guarantee immortality by immortalizing the body. What in other civilizations is a, more a concept than a vision has become something quite concrete in Egypt. This fact also struck the Greeks. In Egypt, the statues of the gods require renewal. So they were actually carried by the Nile and they were washed and oiled. What normally belongs to the spirit or the mind world in Egypt belongs to the earth. That is the psychological reversal expressed in the earth being taken as a male principle and the female as the sky. What is not concrete in Egypt are moods, feelings, and sentiments. They have a spiritual connotation. Now, what would it mean if the principle of fertility were masculine instead of feminine? If the nature principle were masculine, what kind of attitude toward life would one expect? I think there would be a compensatory kind of passivity toward nature. To an active hunter, the wood or the sea with their animals is a simile for the woman. He penetrates nature and enters it and gets nourishment there. He needs, of course, charm and luck. But in the penetration of the hunting ground, he has the feeling of active life. In such a case, the thou in nature is a woman. Nature is felt to be irrational is loved and hated as a woman, and as regarded as tricky and cruel and unreliable like a woman, and the fertility and food bestower is therefore a goddess. But on the contrary, men who have the introverted feeling attitude and do not believe in doing things, or if they do them, do not feel that it is the essential thing, will experience nature more as an active male principle of life and themselves as recipients of its gifts. In this tribe, they pray to the moon by throwing up ladles, a feminine symbol they want to receive passively. To go out in the kayaks with harpoons is a minor thing, for it is the mysterious something in nature which sends the animals and fish and reindeer. The hunter is the wife, the woman, and nature sends the animal. If a woman dreams about the moon god, that indicates her feelings vis-a-vis -vis the unconscious. She is passive and cannot realize that she could do something. The unconscious is something active which affects her, and she only asks for something. The story then tells that when the moon god faints through the magic of the spider woman, it is the moment of the new moon. We can guess from the story that this passing out of the moon god happens quite regularly, and that the spider woman is the great power that makes the moon wane. So the girl gets into this play of opposites between the moon and the spider woman, the feminine and the masculine. The spider here is benevolent and the moon god is a kind of moody creator. The spider woman is a symbol of the self for a woman, a positive and stronger figure than the moon. In spite of this, seen from the side of feminine psychology and as helping the girl against the destructive animus, who is a kind of a bluebeard. The girl cannot escape back to earth because of her inborn weakness and her inability to open her eyes. This theme belongs to many stories and is common in primitive civilizations where the process of individuation goes on in a kind of sleepy lethargy and unawareness. But we have to keep this in mind. For though we talk about primitive people, we have in some layers of our own populations the same kind of person unawakened, animal-like people who cannot go into the unconscious or become conscious and for whom any contact with the unconscious is only destructive. Such people must be kept out of analysis. Beginners make a big mistake there because these people produce wonderful and archetypal material and naturally, if one looks at the material alone, one can think that it is something exceptional. But one should not forget to look at the person and see whose dreams and visions they are, and whether there is any possibility of even a partial integration of the material. Sometimes, one discovers that there is no possibility of such a thing, and that one cannot lead such people on the path of individuation. You may ask whether it depends on the analyst's arbitrary judgment, whether he thinks somebody's suitable or not. 
but it is the material itself which will show. The impossibility for the process of individuation to come about is to be found in the little details of the material. So you have to interpret the smallest detail in dreams most carefully in order to be able to decide. In this story, there are two such details. One is when the girl misses the right path and the other when she opens her eyes a minute too late. In these two details, the story deviates from the normal pattern of a shamanistic journey, which is the pattern of initiation. In Murcia Iliadi's book on shamanism, one can see that in all the circumpolar tribes, the shamans are initiated through experiences such as are related in our story. The shaman climbs a cord to heaven and then returns by means of it to earth. Afterward, he carries a cord as a sign of his connection with the other world. They see the rituals from above and get initiated through what happens there. Our heroine experiences a classical shaman initiation, but it fails. The Eskimos believe that crazy possessed people and the shaman are the same, except that the latter can free themselves again. Possession and mental illness and being a shaman are very close, but there are definite criteria as to which is which. Going up to heaven, meeting the spider, getting the four pieces of whale skin and so forth could well appear in a person's material, but yet he could not go on the path of individuation. In the beginning of the analysis, when one has not yet made a diagnosis to whether one is faced with a psychosis or with somebody simply overwhelmed by the unconscious, the dreams can look just the same. I have seen initial dreams which said that the sea flooded the whole land. That could be psychotic or that graves opened up and corpses rolled around and came alive. That could also be psychotic. Actually, the unconscious only shows that the collective unconscious is absolutely on top of this person. But you can only say that this is a state which looks psychotic, though it is not necessarily so. But if it is, that will show up in the poverty of the reaction toward the material. The lack of vitality and the reaction to such a motif will show either an extreme stupidity or an entire absence of reaction. That is where you can find traces of a possible psychosis. If you see that, you cannot go with the analyzant into the unconscious. At the beginning of an analysis, a woman dreamed that she saw the wedding or coronation of Queen Elizabeth. The dreamer was in a strange medieval town where the wedding took place and was milling around among excited crowds in the streets. A long procession came headed by four black and then four brown horses, and the four parts and the tails of the horses were like roosters. Afterward came a sun god, followed by the queen, who was like a supernatural goddess. Then came numbers of elephants and lions and so on. The dreamer was then back in the crowd and had to find a place from which to see the procession, and then realized that she had not cleaned her shoes and must do so. But then an infantile shadow figure came up and diverted her attention, and the dream ended. There is tremendous activity in the unconscious, and this could be healthy or not. She is in the crowd, that is, in the collective, but that could be healthy or not. Normal people, too, can be overwhelmed by the unconscious. That she cannot at once find her place shows that there is a certain weakness, but even that is not yet fatal. She realizes that she must clean her shoes, a very healthy thing. What is really important is that she has a clean standpoint, that she would not lie and cheat, would take her analysis seriously and would take everything that came toward her in life. She was a great liar, but now an infantile figure, a childish girl, diverts her attention from the fact that she has to clean her shoes, and here the dream fades and has no solution. The whole thing, the dream says, will go wrong on account of an infantility, which the dreamer seems to be incapable of overcoming. Because the dream seemed unhealthy or dangerous in only one place, I decided to take on the analyzant, and for a few weeks or two months, there was good progress, but I was always up against the infantility. She always complained and wanted to be babied and was always dependent on different people. She took a room and complained of the landlady, 
but went on being influenced by her. These were typical symptoms of infantility, and then something happened which brought the case to an end. Her former analyst, a woman, came to Zurich from another country to fish her back. The analyzan had written that she was satisfied with me, and that aroused the vanity of the other analyst, who talked to her and told her that I was an inappropriate person who would lead her to disaster. So the analyst stopped. Later, the patient took up anthroposophy and then developed a cancer phobia and became a hypochondriacal homeopathic in an effort to circumvent the supposed cancer threat. Finally, she wrote to me that she would like to work with me again, saying that she realized that she had done something stupid and accusing the other analyst as though she could not have resisted that interference. She said that she would come one day again but I have heard nothing since. The peering out process in her dream came right into life through her infantility. It was not her fault. She just had not the strength to stand up against the other analyst. The dangerous element often shows the last detail of the dream, but is sometimes hidden in the middle, in some small point, and the beauty of the material is no guarantee against it. This is a classical initiation dream, but it goes wrong, and as the Eskimo story says, it is because of the weakness of the personality. This woman was a primitive peasant girl, and she was not mature enough to swing it. it. does not mean that people coming from a primitive layer cannot do it. Nature is aristocratic, but her system of aristocracy is different from our social ideas and goes through the layers of society. It is very important to have the right feeling about this, as otherwise one lures people into a process which they cannot carry. Jung mentions a dream in the Children's Dreams seminar in which a little girl who later became schizophrenic dreamed that Jack Frost touched her stomach. Jung said that the pathological element here was that the girl had no reaction. If the dreamer had woken up frightened, or if she had just said, then I woke up. That would have been equivalent to a reaction, but Jack Frost, the personified winter, came and touched her and there was no affect. Sometimes people wake up with a cry, which is a vital reaction and a kind of lysis. Such a dream has a shock effect, but the amazing thing in the child's dream is that it has not even a shock effect. Jack Frost is a demon of the cold who should inspire fear. It is typical for schizophrenics that they will tell horrible dreams without any emotion. They speak of them as though they were rolls at breakfast and cups of coffee. That is a serious symptom. Or very often when there is a latent psychosis, there is a very narrow-minded rationalism which absolutely refuses a symbolic interpretation of dreams. Jung had observed that extreme narrow-mindedness can be a symptom of psychosis. Such narrow-mindedness cannot understand symbols. I knew a psychotic case in which the woman had a compulsion. She always fastened papers together with clips. I asked her why, and she said that one day the window might be open and the wind might blow in and cause confusion. That was highly symbolic. The wind is the spirit of the unconscious, and one day that would blow in and she might never get out of her mental confusion again. So she pinned everything down. She was caught in a very narrow-minded, limited attitude about everything. A pure defensive mechanism. Such people have no spirit of adventure. They are frightened and caught by rationalism. Stinginess can be the same. It expresses the same thing. One cannot let go, cannot risk. One must keep everything together. Because the frame might break loose at any minute. Thus, the poverty of reactions is more important to watch than the symbolism itself it indicates either a morbid disposition or, as in our story, a primitiveness which prevents any further inner development. The heroine returns to Earth in the form of a spider. If she had kept her human body, she would have fallen to her death. So the spider woman turns her into a spider. The spider woman is a great mother figure who appears here in a benevolent form. Within the psyche of a woman, she represents the self. In Zuni mythology, there also occurs a spider woman 
who lives in the confines of the earth. She is sometimes helpful and sometimes dangerous to men. In Hindu mythology, the spider is symbolic of a form of the goddess Maya, who represents that mysterious factor which makes us believe that the outer material world is the reality. The Hindu saint tries to overcome this delusion and thus transcend the world. In folklore, the spider is often considered to be a witch animal because of its shrewd way of trapping its prey. As the Maya aspect revealed, the spider is connected with the source of creative fantasy in the unconscious psyche. A woman who had to turn within and leaving outer activities had to develop her creativity had the following dream. I was in a prison, a dark, gloomy place. I received a parcel from whom I didn't know, but I knew that in that little white box was a spider. I wasn't sure if it was poisonous or not. I thought I must feed it through a little hole in the top of the box. I put a crumb in. That spider was God. A prison symbolizes the introversion which was forced upon her, but which she did not yet like. There she received a gift from the unconscious, the little white box with the spider. Then comes the surprising last sentence, the spider is God. The creative kernel at the bottom of the human psyche is nothing more or less than the presence of the divinity. This divine center spins, so to speak, the consistent thread of fate along which we move. That is what the spider woman teaches the heroine in our story to do. With the help of this thread, she can return to the earth, but then she does not open her eyes and as a consequence remains a spider forever. She gets stuck in the inner world of fantasy and cannot return into human society. Viewed from outside, this could mean plain madness or only a mild case of remaining isolated and odd. It is the story of failed shamanistic journey with all its tragic consequences. Our next stories will represent such a journey, but with positive endings.